we're very happy to have uh, Luis Ferroni, who's uh, at KTH in Stockholm, uh, telling us about Earhart polynomials of slices of rectangular prisms. So take it away, Luis. Okay, um, I want to start by thanking uh, the organizers for, for having me and, and for organizing this, uh, this very nice uh, virtual meeting. Um, yeah, the title of the talk is Erhard Polynomials of Slices of Rectangular Prisms. Um, I, 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 I want to mention that this is a joint work with Daniel McGuinness. Uh, he's a PhD student at, at Iowa State University in the US. And um, yeah, I want to start by motivating what's, what this talk will be about. Um, perhaps you know the polytope called the hypersimplex. It is defined by the following uh, set in, in Rn. You consider all the points in the hypercube of, of dimension n that have sum of coordinates equals to k. So you have two parameters, k and n. This defines a polytope. That is very relevant, for example, in matrix theory, given that this is the base polytope of a uniform matroid. Uh, in graph theory, given that this uh, polytope is uh, very related with the Johnson graph. It's also related with Grassmannians, specifically with totally non-negative Grassmannians and, and uh, subdivisions of, of matroids. It's related with the theory of alkyl polytopes due to, to, to certain properties re regarding triangulations that, that hypersimplices hyper have, and much more, tropical geometry, coding theory, statistics of permutations, and, 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 and so on. So I want to convince you that, that the hypersimplex, which is uh, like a two-parameter um, family of polytopes, um, is of much relevance in, in several areas within combinatorics. Basic facts about this polytope. So the first thing that one might ask is, OK, this, this uh, description that I gave before is the inequality description. What are the vertices of this polytope? Um, the description is very nice. The vertices are, are all the 0, 1 vectors in our n that have exactly k1s and n minus k zeros. And moreover, a basic fact that, that, that was noticed by, 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 by Laplace, of, I mean, many years ago, but, but Stanley gave a proper proof uh, of, of this using combinatorial language, is that the volume of the hypersimplex is given by one divided n minus one factorial, this is a normalizing everything, times an Eulerian number. This number, a n minus one, k minus one, counts the number of permutations on n minus one uh, elements that have exactly k minus one decents. So here we see that the volume of this like very um, concrete slice of, of, of a cube um, already has a interesting or, or at least enigmatic combinatorial interpretation. Also, from the proof that Stanley gave of, of this fact, it follows that the hypersimplex admits a certain uh, unimodular triangulation, which is particularly nice. Let us consider a generalization of the volume. So, so we don't want only to, to, to measure our polytope by, by, by saying what's its volume, but we want to, to, to extend this a little bit further. <clears throat> and there is a notion of, uh, of, of lattice point enumerator, which is the Erhard polynomial. Oh, excuse which, me, just a uh, small question. So this uh, triangulation, it is uh, triangulation in matroid polytopes or? No, no, no. Uh, it's uh, actually, no, the, the, the ah, polytope. So it's not matroid. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But, but if you are interested in subdivisions of the hypersimplex into matrix polytopes, um, then uh, th there is a lot of very interesting theory that, that, that you, can, you can learn about. Uh, actually, uh, there is a paper about splits of the hypersimplex into matrix polytopes due to Joswe and Schroeder. That, that's the main reading about that. So, okay, I continue. What's the Erhard polynomial? So you give me an integer number t, a non-negative integer t, and you want to count the number of lattice points that lie in the teeth dilation of your polytope. So you, you take p, whatever polytope you want, which has integral vertices, 
you dilate it by the factor t, and then you want to count the number of lattice points inside that. The remarkable fact is that this, as you vary t, defines a polynomial in t. Uh, moreover, this polynomial has degree, the dimension of the polytope, and moreover, there are interpretations for some of the coefficients of this polynomial. For example, um, the leading coefficient is the volume of the polynomial. The second coefficient, the ad minus one here, gives you one half the sum of the volumes of all the facets of the polytope. And the last term, the last, uh, the, the, the independent term is always one. The issue is that the, mid, the terms in the middle from A1 up to AD minus two, all of them can be negative in general. In fact, all of them can be negative simultaneously if you restrict to, I mean, if you don't put any additional assumptions on the type of polytope you're considering. Okay, there is another object associated to a polytope, which is the H star polynomial, which is built in the following fashion. You take a series that has in the coefficient of degree J, the number of lattice points in the J dilate of your polytope. So you're, you are just evaluating your error polynomial in J. You build this, this uh, generating function, and this can be written as a quotient between a polynomial h star of x and this factor one minus six to the d, d plus plus one, where d is always the dimension of the polytope. And the interesting fa fact also proved by, by Stanley in, in 1993 is that the numerator of this uh, expression is uh, a polynomial which has always non-negative integer coefficients. So the Erhard polynomial can have negative coefficients and in general, they are rational numbers not necessarily integers, but the H star are always, um, its coefficients are always non-negative integers. In particular, we, we, we usually write the H star using um, H zero up to HD as the coefficients. The major problems in our theory are, for example, finding conditions that H star polynomials of lattice polytopes must satisfy, for example, inequalities up to dimension Two, I think you can characterize, you can tell if you give an, a polynomial of degree two to someone, is this the H star of someone of some polytope? You can give a, a, a deterministic answer very easily by looking at some inequalities. I think that in dimension three, this is open. So, so this is a, an important problem that, that people working in hard theory think about. And another condition, another problem that one, one can address is to find combinatorial interpretations for the, for the coefficients of the H star polynomial. This is because they, they are uh, non-negative integers. So for, for, for the coefficients of the Erhard polynomial, finding a combinatorial interpretation seems like very complicated because they can be negative in general. They, they, they are rational numbers. So it's a slightly more complicated, but for the H star, it is already a challenging problem to do it. Okay, what about the hypersimplex? Um, okay. I will be very vague about this, but let us call W, L, N, N plus one, the number of permutations on N elements that have exactly N plus one cycles and weight L. I will tell you uh, in, in, in a few slides what the weight is uh, for, for, for a permutation with N plus one cycles. So you, you, you put a weight on permutations with a, with a certain number of cycles and you count them and one motivating result, um, which, which uh, was part of my PhD thesis, is that for the hypersimplex, you can tell the coefficient of degree m of the Erhard polynomial, and it has a combinatorial meaning. So you consider the coefficient of degree m of the Erhard polynomial of the, of the hypersimplex delta kn. It will be 1 divided n minus 1 factorial. This is a normalization that always occurs in Erhard polynomials, times this sum where you see here the numbers W, which are counting permutations according to weights, and the Eulerian numbers, which are counting permutations according to descents. So something very weird is happening here. For the Erhard polynomial in general, we, we are not able to, 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 to find combinatorial interpretations. But for the hypersimples, we can. And, 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 and although the formula for each coefficient is slightly involved, we, 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 we know what, what 
um, at least we know more or less what these things are. In particular, we see that the hypersimplex is, is R hard positive. This, this was a conjecture due to, to, to Stanley and, and to, uh, to Deloera, Hoss, and Kepe in the context of matrix polytopes. Uh, and the next natural question would be, what about the um, H star polynomial? Okay, in, uh, in 2017, uh, Nick Early conjectured uh, that certain objects um, count um, determine if you count them, if you enumerate them, they tell you what um, the coefficients of the H star polynomial of the hypersimplex are. I won't define what these subjects are now. I will show you in a minute what they are exactly. But essentially, the coefficient of degree M of the H star polynomial of the hypersimplex is the number of decorated order set partitions of type Kn and winding number n. It's a lot of uh, information. So let us skip this for a minute, but you have to think about this. So these coefficients are counting something. We can tell what is this something. Uh, and, and moreover, we, we, we can play a little bit with this. And, and we will see how to generalize both the previous result and this result for a much larger class of polytubes. So the title of my talk is Erhard polynomials of slices of prisms, prisms. So what is a slice of a prism? It is what you expect that to be. You take a, a bunch of positive integers in Rn. You will build a rectangular prism that will have sides um, c1, c2, c3. They are all orthogonal to each other. So it is a box in some sense. Formally, it is defined by the inequalities. Uh, you bound the, the eth coordinate of, the, of, of your vector in Rn by the number ci and by zero. And the kth slice of that will be intersecting your prism with the hyperplane having sum of coordinates equals to k. The basic example, of course, is the hypersimplex. If you take the unit cube, which is a prism, and you slice it with the hyperplane sum of coordinates equals to k, you get the hypersimplex. But think he, things here get much more delicate. Let us see an example so we, we, we see what's going on here. Consider, for example, a prism in R3 that has sides of length 6, 3, 4, and let, I mean, let us intersect it with the hyperplane sum of coordinates equals to 7. Here we see in the, on the left um, this, this, this box and, and how we slice it. Already here we see that we get a pentagon. This is interesting because the combinatorics of this polytope, namely number of edges, is already very different from the case of a hypersimplex. You can see here the vertices of this, uh, this, um, of this polygon in R3. And this thing is what we will call a thin slice of a prism, OK? Because there is a notion of fat slice of a prism, um, which essentially will be taking a rectangular prism and taking two hyperplanes, two parallel hyperplanes, and, 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 and looking what's in the middle of these two hyperplanes. So you consider your, your vector of integer c, which give you the sides of your prism. And you consider all the things that have some co coordinates between a and b, where a and b are, are two distinct numbers. If they are equal, then this collapses to the previous case. This will be a fat slice. Um, Luis, so here we see, yes. Uh, do you care if? if you're going to get out an integral polytope? OK, the, the interesting thing is that you always do get out an integral polytope. Oh, OK. Yeah, you always you take any prism, you slice it, you will get integral vertices. And this is my next, yeah, my I think my next slide. Um, so here you see an example. You see, uh, sorry, you see the box having sides four, three, two. This is a, the, the, this, uh, this prism here. And you take two hyperplanes, sum of coordinates equals to three. That's in red here. And sum of coordinates equals to five. That's in blue here. And you take whatever it's in, in the middle, you get this um, strange polytope. This is a fat slice of a prism. The thing is that for us, uh, since we care about the Erhard polynomials, we, we can just Forget about the fat slices and focus only on thin slices. Um, 
because we have this theorem. You take a fat slice, whatever fat slice you want, you can build a thin slice, which has the same Erhard polynomial. What do you have to do? Okay, you, you go to one extra dimension and you put this in your, in your, in your set of, 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 of side lengths of your prism, the number B minus A, which will be positive if, if you start with a fat slice. The Erhard of, of your thin slice and your fat slice is the same. So for Erhard theoretic purposes, we can focus only on thin slices. Basic properties of these polytopes. Remark, slices of prisms are alkyl polytopes. This is something interesting because the, there is a theorem due to uh, Lam and Posnikov that says that if you have any integral polytope defined by in inequalities, uh, which are of the form xi plus xi plus one plus xi plus two, blah, 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 up to plus xj bounded between two numbers, and you intersect a, a bunch of them, you will always get an integral polytope uh, as long as the bounds you have are inter integers. So that um, also answers uh, Liam's question. These are always integral polytopes. Moreover, the edges of a slice of a prism are always parallel to some vector of the form EI minus EJ. So I will go back to the thin slice that we con considered before. Here we have this vertex 304 and this vertex 601. They are connected by a, an edge. And the, I mean, if, if, if you go from, from this vertex to this vertex, the difference is three, zero, minus three. This is parallel to some EI minus EJ. It's E1 minus E3 times three. Um, polytopes having that property are called generalized promotohedra or for people working on combinatorial opt optimization, polymatroids. So slices of prisms are at the same time alkyl polytopes and polymatroids. The intersection of, of I mean, the polytopes satisfying these two properties are known as polypositroids. These are uh, very intriguing stuff that what were also introduced by, by Lam and Posnikov. And there is a conjecture that I will mention as related to this, uh, which is due to, to myself and, and uh, Katharina Johemko and Benjamin Schroeder, which is that positroids are Erhard positive. I, it, it, I mean, deep inside my soul, I think that polypositroids are Erhard positive. Um, so, so we expect these slices of prism, because they are polypositroids, to have positive Erhard coefficients. And we'll see that that is true. Before that, I want to give you some other motivation just in case you, you come from the, 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 the algebra side of combinatorics, which is that interpreting the, the Erhard polynomial of these slices of prisms and the A star of these slices of prisms um, has a relation with something known as algebra of Veronese type. So just a reminder of what an algebra of Veronese type is. You have a set of numbers, you have an integer k, you build an algebra, which is uh, a graded over a field f and is uh, generated by all the monomials with n variables that have all the exponents summing to k and bounded by each ci. So this is very much like taking a prism, slicing it to relate it. Uh, formally, there is a, a theorem due to Hebe and, and the Negri in, uh, 25 years ago which tells you that this algebra is isomorphic to some ring that you can build from the polytope, uh, from, from the slice, from, yeah, for, from, from, from the slice of prism that, that, that you consider using these same parameters. And the interesting thing is that <clears throat> giving an interpretation for the Erhard polynomial and the H star polynomial of these um, slices of prisms will also answer from the commutative algebra point of view, the problem of interpreting the numerator of the Hilbert series of an arbitrary algebra of Veronese type. So you start with an arbitrary algebra of Veronese type, you build the slice of prism, you do the thing that I would show you, and you will get the interpretation. So if you want to prove whatever thing that has to do with properties of H vectors of algebra satisfying nice properties, this is machinery you can use. Moreover, you will have that an interpretation for a Hilbert function. That, that is all, sometimes not, not, not particularly um, well behaved in general, uh, but for slices of prisms and, and algebra of Veronese type, you will see how, how you can do it. 
So let us go to the combinatorics. You will see that for the hypersimplex, we had this W and this uh, Eulerian numbers. What's, what do we expect for an arbitrary slice of a prism? Okay, these are the objects that we, we need to count. So I will define a weighted permutation to be a permutation with a weight function that will assign a number to each cycle. Okay, so I start with a fractal C, a cycle of, of my permutation, and I will assign a number. Here, I have a permutation for, of numbers from one to six, and I assign a weight to each of these cycles, okay? And I will say that the weighted permutation is C compatible, where C is a vector of numbers, if the following thing is fulfilled. The weight assigned to each cycle is smaller than the sum of the CIs indexed by the coordinates of the numbers inside the cycle. This is very strange. But let us see an example. Consider the following set of numbers, two, four, six, eight, and consider the following weighted permutation. Here, I have the numbers from one to four, and I assign weight six to the first cycle, weight 11 to the second. I claim that this thing is C compatible. Why? Okay, if you consider the weight of the first cycle, it is six, that's number in red here, and it is smaller than the number sum of all the coordinates belonging to that cycle. You consider CI as two and six, which are the first and the third entry here. It's smaller, satisfy that definition. And also with the second cycle, the weight of the second cycle is 11 and the number, the sum of C2 and C4 is 12, which is smaller. So we get here a C compatible permutation. Also, the total weight of my permutation, which is the sum of all the weights of all the cycles, is in this case 17. Okay. Is this clear? Um, okay. Now let us state what the Erhard volume of a slice of a prism is. We will define first W, L, N, N plus one C. So here we have, uh, let, me, let me count, N plus three numbers as inputs, one, two, three, and here N numbers, um, actually N plus two, because here I am, I mean, this N actually is already encoded in the length of C, but I mean, you have a, a lot of numbers and you count the number of C compatible weighted permutations of length n that have n plus one cycle and total weight k, uh, total weight l, sorry. So you do all of that. And then the, one of the main results here is that you can tell the, the coefficient of degree m of the slice of a prism by using this sum, which is very similar to the case of the hypersimplex. But here you have this additional input c, of course. Um, and it shows that the coefficients of the Erhard polynomials of arbitrary slices of prims are positive. Um, okay, so I, I, I have a few minutes, so I, I want to also to discuss some, some combinatorial uh, consequences of, of these things. Since we have a formula for the Erhard polynomial, um, now the thing is, what's the volume? Because the volume is a leading term. And I will define an object that, that allows you to enumerate the volume, to, to tell the volume, and also generalizes Stanley's result that the volume of the hypersimplex is the Eulerian number. So um, a C-color permutation will be a permutation with a function that assigns to, to each number, um, uh, I mean, to each number from one to n, some number s uh, sub i, that have to be bounded by ci minus one. If I consider a set of all these c color permutations, I will denote it by sn uh, c in this way. I can define a notion of descent of this thing by considering all the positions in which my, let's say, color si increases or it stays the same, but the permutation has a, a, an ascent or a decent, uh, in this case, a decent. Um, and the flag decent number of a C-color permutation will be defined as this complicated expression. What you have to think about is that this is extending in the most natural way what 
would be the case of, of, of counting descents for usual permutations. Um, the flag Eulerian number, which is defined in the, with this notation that reminds of the Eulerian numbers, will be the number of C color permutations that have length n and k minus one descents. Here, I, I ask you for forgiveness because of the difference of the indexing. In, in the first slide, I, I used the notation uh, a n minus one, k minus one to things of length n and k minus one descents. But the reason is that in the literature, there are two groups of people using different indexing. And this is like much easier to see in, in a certain context in which you have this shifting. But the thing that I wanted to tell you is that the volume of the fat slice uh, lying between k minus one and k and a bunch of number c will be this thing which generalizes Stanley's result and Laplace's result. So we have um, like a, a generalization of this to, to a much more delicate combinatorial object, but that we can enumerate. Also, I have to mention that the case in which all the coordinates of C are equal to some number R, this last theorem reduces to, to, to one of the many nice results that Han and Joshua Berger uh, have on, on related polytopes. And of course, the case R equals one, and, and I mean, all the entries equal to one recovered uh, what I was saying, Laplace's result. Let us finish very quickly with What's, uh, what's the, the H star polynomial, just in case you, you were wondering about that. So you have another object that you have to enumerate. A decorated order set partition of type Kn will be a cyclically order partition uh, C of length N and a function that will assign to each part of the partition a non-negative integer in such a way that this total sum of the weights of all the parts of the partition is k. Um, and the thing is that we will de define a notion of C compatibility for these objects by asking that the weight of each part is bounded by the sum of the weights indexed by each of the numbers belonging to, to that part. Let us see an example. Consider the following, the following cyclically ordered partition of the numbers from one to eight. So here I have three parts. Three sets. These sets are ordered. You can think of a circle, and you have like you can assume that the first in the in the, in the order is this this two five, the second is four seven a, and the third one is one three six, or any other cyclic permutation of that. Let us assume that the weight of the first part is one, the weight of the second part is two, and the weight of the second the third part is four. Just some some way that I put as an example. Um, I claim that this, per, this, this thing is C compatible using this C. And the reason is very simple. If you compute the weight of the first part, it is one because I declared that to be one. And the sum of the CIs in position one, three, and six is um, nine, which is greater than one. And the same for the second part and the same for the last part. So this is a C compatible using this C permutation of type, um, in this case, um, well, seven and length eight. You can define a notion of winding number. So you have your object. You consider these objects arranged in a circle in the following way. Since the weight of the first part was one, okay, so I, I, I I put my, my, my first part here and I leave one blank space. I put the two five here. Then since the weight of the two five is two, I leave two blank spaces and I put the four, six, seven, four, seven, eight here. Since the last part has weight four, I leave four spaces and I reach again this, this first part. So I, I, I can represent my, my, my cyclically ordered weighted partition this way. And uh, the wind number will be uh, here, will be, you count um, for each of the numbers here, take one, for example, how many steps do you have to do until reaching the number two? You do one step, here you reach the number two. You are in number two, you want to reach number three, 
you have to do one, two, three, four, five, six. You reach the number three. Now, how do you reach a number four? You one, two, th three. And the thing is that if you uh, have this object and you want to, um, to consider lambda i, the number of steps that you do from going to the number i to the number i plus one using this uh, thing, and you sum all these numbers from one to n, in the end, you will have like going around uh, around the circle like a lot of times. And the winding number will be like counting how many number of times you did that. So the, the other main result is that the coefficient of degree m of the h star polynomial of slices of a prism is given by the number of C-compatible decorated order set partitions of type Kn and, and y the number m. So it's a lot of parameters, but this is uh, the interpretation for, for this, this h star. And I want to mention very briefly to end two conjectures. I conjecture that the roots of this polynomial having uh, the w's as coefficients, I mean, you fix c, you fix k, and you, and you fix m, and you vary l, this thing seems to have all of its roots lying on the unit circle. So they all have a uh, modulus one in the complex plane. That's very intriguing. And the second conjecture is that uh, we conjecture that the H star for slice of a prism is always rerouted. And moreover, that there is some interlacing property, which is that if you take the n number C1 up to C Cn and you take C prime, like having the first, uh, n minus one coordinates here. To the last one, you decrease by one and you add an extra one. So you have the same sum here, but you have an extra coordinate. Then uh, our claim is that for all case, you will have that the h star of this slice of a prism interlaces the h star of this other slice of a prism. The thing is that if you like iterate this thing, you will get a sequence of inter interlacing things. And the last thing that you will get is the h star of a hypersimplex. And it is a long open problem to prove that the H star of the hypersimplex is rear rooted. So I invite you, if you want to think about it. That's all I have. Thank you.